Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori, and today we're going to go over Chapter 12 of The Absorbent Mind by Maria Montessori. And Chapter 12 is called The Effect of Obstacles on Development. So before we begin, let's take a look at Chapter 11 one more time. We have this chart in Chapter 11, Figure 7, which is the Development of Language chart. And if we zoom in, we can see that a lot of things happened between the ages of 0 and 2.5. Now we're going to take the same chart and we're going to look at it just a little bit differently. In chapter 13, we're going to look at this chart again, but we're going to look at it through the lens of the grammar symbols. Now in Montessori, we use symbols to label different parts of grammar. So this chart right here, figure 8, is the development of language from its nebulous stage to conscious expression in grammatical form. Now this simply means that the nebula stage, which is the potentiality of the child, the full potentiality, is represented in this chart. And as we go through the potentiality, we start connecting it to different parts of grammar. So if you can zoom in and take a look at the noun, the noun is represented by a large black triangle. And you're going to see that that large black triangle is very prominent around the age of one year old. So that one years old, the child is really trying to label their world. They're trying to label their environment, and they do that with nouns. And so that's why you're going to see that symbol coming up. And then, of course, we have the adjective and the article. Now, we also have some verbs happening at this time, too, and that is represented by the red circle. And we will get more into these symbols and what they mean and why Maria Montessori chose these symbols later on. But for this chapter, I just want you to be aware of their existence and that we'll get into that a little bit later on. Now let's get back to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we're talking about the effects of obstacles on development. So we're going to take language and we're going to connect it with the development of the person. So you're going to see that there is this connection between the language and the development of the human and any obstacle to language or any obstacle to development is going to change the way that the person develops into an adult. So on page 115, Maria Montessori says, the first explosion is therefore one of words. The second explosion is one of thought. And we saw this in that second chart. So that's when you see this first explosion. It's that explosion of words, typically nouns. And then the second explosion happens. The second explosion is one of thought. And you're gonna start seeing that the child is expressing their thoughts or trying to express their thoughts. And this is gonna have a huge impact, not just on their language development, but also on their development as a person. On page 116, she says, but before these explosions can occur, there must have been some kind of preparation. This may be hidden and secret, but the fact of its existence is no mere guess or hypothesis, for we can see by their results the efforts the child has been making to express his thoughts. And so we've talked a lot about this language development and that language is this mental organ. It's something that develops, but we can't see it. We can't actually see language being developed, but we can see the effects of it, right? We can see that all this work, all this inner work is going on inside the child, and then all of a sudden this explosion of language happens, and we can see the effects of all that development. She goes on to say, it is because the adult cannot always understand what the little child is trying to say that the child's bouts of irritation and anger occur. The quest of language is a laborious journey to that greater independence which speech gives, and dangers of regression lurk here also. So if you are a parent or if you're somebody who's worked with two-year-olds that age, that zero to three age group, you can really see when a child is angry. And a lot of the times, this is when biting happens. This is when hitting happens. The child doesn't have any way to express themselves. They don't have a way to meet their own needs. They have that limitation, right? And you see that limitation. You see that frustration coming out in different ways. And during that time, we tend to tell parents if they're wondering, well, what do I do? I have a child that's biting. What am I supposed to do? Or if you're a parent of a child who's the victim of being bitten, you're very worried about, well, what does this mean? You know, how can I get this child to stop biting my child? 
And the best advice that a lot of experienced teachers give is the more you work on language, the more you work on communication, the more you help your child express and label what's going on inside of his mind, the better he'll be able to communicate. And as soon as he can communicate those needs and say, I want this, I want that, or I don't want this, and I don't want that, the sooner he can do that, the sooner that biting is going to stop because he's able to do things for himself. He's able to communicate. He's able to be understood. But sometimes that doesn't happen and the child uses whatever means they have, whatever power they have to express what they want or don't want. Maria Montessori also says, this is a difficult period for the child because his obstacles are all environmental or due to limitations in his own powers. It is the second time that he finds adaptation difficult. Now, the first time that the child finds adaptation to the world difficult is right after birth. Maria Montessori calls this birth terror. So this shock of birth makes it difficult for the child to adapt to the world. And we have to be very sensitive to the baby's needs right after they're born because this is a shock for them to be born into this world. Now, this second difficulty for adaptation comes when he knows what he wants, that he understands things, things are going on inside of his mind, but he doesn't have the ability to communicate them or he doesn't have the physical ability to do something about it. So he has this limitation in his powers. And so the child will do different things, whatever he has power to do, when he feels powerless. And she goes on to say, just as children in this period retain what they learn for the rest of their lives, so do they retain the unfortunate effects of obstacles. A struggle, a dread, a reverse of some kind can have incalculable consequences since the reaction to these obstacles becomes absorbed just as much as the positive effects of progress. So it's really important to remember here that when we see the child going through this difficulty, when we see that they're having difficulty adapting to the world in this type of a way, that we have to keep in mind that the child's mind is absorbent. It's like that sponge, remember? If you put the sponge in clean water, it's going to absorb clean water. But if you put the sponge in dirty water, it can't discriminate, right? It can't say, oh, I just want to absorb the clean water. It can't do that. It is going to absorb everything that it comes in contact with. So it does not discriminate between clean or dirty water. The child's mind at this point in time, between the ages of zero and six, can't discriminate. It can't discriminate what it absorbs. It's just going to absorb everything. So we have to remember that whatever the child is struggling with, whatever they're dreading, whatever they're going through at that point in time, it is going to be absorbed and they're gonna carry it with them whether consciously or unconsciously. And on page 117, she says, most of the mental disturbances of adult life are traceable to these early years. Educational theory nowadays gives much more importance to freedom of expression, connecting this not only with the immediate needs of the speech mechanism, but also with the future life of the individual. So right here, she's really tying that language component into how the child develops their mind and their mental health later on. And also understand that when the child is limited in their language, limited in their ability to do things for themselves, they are going to re respond in a way that they have power and the only way that they have power to do something for themselves. And in those moments, how we respond and how we react will also be absorbed by the child. So that's what she's emphasizing right here. And she says on page 118, difficulty speaking stems from possibly a lack of courage to speak, lack of courage in forming words, difficulty in the use of sentences. And she also says the speech is slower than normal sometimes. And that can have an impact on the child. And she says these failings proceed from that period of life in which the speech mechanism was being formed. So she's really connecting this ability to speak, the confidence to speak, the courage to speak is all being formed in this zero to six age group. And it affects the adult going forward in life. It affects their confidence. It, it, it affects their ability to communicate with others. And I just want us to think for a second about what has been going on 
over the last couple years when we've had all the lockdowns, when we've been masking children, when we've been masking adults, we have put a very serious obstacle in the way of language development. We put a serious obstacle in allowing the child to express themselves both through words and also through facial expressions, right? Not only can we not see the child's facial expression, but they haven't been able to see the adult's facial expressions. So that's an obstacle. And we really don't know the damage that that obstacle is making on society until the child gets to be 10, 20 years old. So we have some time ahead of us to see how this will negatively affect the child. But she does emphasize that this is the time when the speech mechanism gets formed in that, that zero to three period of life. And those thoughts of expression really are exploding in the three to six year old age of life. If we miss the opportunity to develop the speech organs, those speech mechanisms, if we miss the opportunity to help the child express themselves through speech in that three to six environment, we're creating obstacles for the child. And that not only affects their ability to communicate, but it also affects their mental health. She goes on to say, these forms of regression are connected with the child's sensitiveness. For we must always remember that the child's sensitiveness is greater than anything we can imagine. And again, that goes back to the absorbent mind. The child absorbs everything. The child is meant to be sensitive between the ages of zero and six. Why is the child sensitive between zero and six? It helps them develop. It helps them understand the world. It helps them adapt to the world. It helps them grow. It helps them observe, it helps them absorb. So that sensitiveness has a purpose. And because the child is so sensitive during the ages of zero to six, they can do remarkable things during that time period. It's necessary for development. And what a child can do between the ages of zero and six, they can never do again for the rest of their lives. So saying that the masks are only for a short time or lockdowns are only for a short time. Well, a short time for an adult, right? But for a child who is very sensitive for those children in the zero to six age group, this is detrimental to their health and development. They don't get this time back. They will never be able to develop in the same way later that they can develop right now. And we need to keep that in mind when we're making these huge decisions for society. Maria Montessori says, it is often a we, the adults, who obstruct the child and so become responsible for anomalies that last a lifetime. Always must our treatment be as gently as possible, avoiding violence, for we easily fail to realize how violent and hard we are being. We have to watch ourselves most carefully. Children have many kinds of sensitiveness but they are all alike in their sensitiveness to trauma. How easy it is to wound them. I have myself sometimes been too severe with a child. And I think that's a really important point that she makes. And I think we all feel that way, whether you're a teacher, a nanny, a babysitter, a sibling, a parent, any role that you take working with younger children, it's easy to forget just how traumatic different experiences can be. It's hard to put ourselves back into that period of life because an adult, you kind of have to shove everything off and forget and move on with life. But a child can't do that. They don't have the ability to do that. They're going to absorb it all. She says another group of anomalies found among grown-ups takes the form of senseless fears and tics. Most of these can also be traced to violence done to the to the little child's extreme sensitivity. Some reflect unfortunate experiences with animals. Others originate with the child's fright at being locked in a room. How often do we long for an interpreter to tell us his meaning? I have worked for a long time on this myself, trying to make myself into the child's interpreter. And I have noted with surprise, if you try to do this for them, they come running to look for you. I don't know if you've noticed that, that if you help a child communicate, if you help them express themselves, if you understand a child well enough to interpret for them, they seek you out. They want to know that they can be understood. They want to know that you understand them and there's a comfort in that, right? Just help me express myself. Help me 
help others to understand me. That is often what the child is looking for. And she says, not anger and violence, but patience marks this period in children's lives. The patience to wait for the right moment. It is when the child cannot express himself, finds inner obstacles to his wish, that he shows violence and rage, or as we call them, tantrums. So sometimes what the child wants isn't good for him, right? And we know that as an adult, we know that we can't always give the child what he wants. But learning to express what he wants and having a discussion with them, and you know between the ages of zero to six, it's not really much of a discussion. You make a decision, and there isn't a whole lot of explaining in the zero to six age group. That's more in the second plane of development, right? What's fair, the child wants to understand what's fair and what's right in that six to 12 age group. In the zero to six, that's not really a big explanation time. It's really more the time to understand what the child is saying and for you to communicate with the child, help them label things and decide mm, this is in your best interest or this is not in your best interest and have that discussion of what it is they want and what you're going to do about it. It isn't the time to negotiate. It isn't the time for big explanations. And it's not the time to relate it to the outside world, which a lot of parents sometimes do in that zero to six age group. That's more of the six to 12 group that you get into those types of conversations. In the zero to six, we're really all about helping the child express himself. He's not ready for big explanations. So if you're finding that the child is upset because there's an inner obstacle to his wish and it's what he wants isn't good for him, it's not the time to lecture or have these big deep discussions about how the world works. It's simply about labeling, helping him be understood and helping him understand you okay, that's not an option right now. Let's find an alternate choice, right? Distract the child, give them an alternate choice. That's what you do in the zero to six age group. In the six to 12, you can go into these deep discussions on what's fair and why and what happens in the outside world outside of your inner circle. So when you see that the child is showing a lot of violence and a lot of rage, bring it back to communication, labeling, expression, and understanding where the child is coming from even if what they want isn't good for them, right? It's really more about the communication at that age, finding the words. So to summarize what she said in this chapter, she says, to this end, we must remember these three things. One, that the first two years of life affect all the rest. Two, that the baby has great mental powers to which little attention has been given. And three, that he is supremely sensitive. And for that reason, any kind of violence produces not only an immediate reaction, but defects, which may be permanent. So that is the summary of chapter 12. There's a lot more there. So if you like what you heard today, read chapter 12 of The Absorbent Mind. I think you'll like it. And we're gonna get more into deviations as we go along in later chapters. So if you liked where we were going here, we're going to get deeper into that later on. So there is more to come on the effects of obstacles and different deviations. But for right now, this is just dipping the toe in the water of the effect of obstacles. So if you like what you heard here, give it a thumbs up, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video.